Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest today is Her Royal Majesty of the Most Highest Supreme World Leader known <laughs> to the peasants as S.J. Morrison. S.J. is a 2L at the Duquesne University School of Law, and today we are going to be recording a double LP podcast episode. On side A, we're going to discuss traditional and open source casebooks, and on side B, SJ will dive into the mind of a law professor, uh, yours truly, for for better or for worse. So, so SJ, welcome to the show. Proud to be here. Yeah, I I could not be happier to have you as my interviewee interview. Er, and just for listeners, you should all know that um, SJ is actually also the editor of the open source, uh, open access casebook on professional responsibility that I am working on with Liz with Liz Schiller, and is an absolute gem. Um, so SJ, I wanted to start by asking you for your opinion on traditional casebooks. What do you think about casebooks, law school casebooks, and what they cost? So traditional casebooks are extortion. I pulled up my tax returns because I wanted to know how much I paid last year, and I paid $2,000. We often approach things from experience, right? So when I was coming into law school, I was thinking about my undergraduate experience and I was also compounding it with looking at my husband's experience in med school because he had just graduated from med school. And I knew in undergrad, I was able to rent my textbooks at about 50 bucks a pop per semester. So 50 bucks a pop, five classes, 300 bucks a semester. That was generally my expectation. And the reason that my experience with my husband was important was because med school Stafford loans are $40,000 a semester, but for law school, they are $20,000 a semester, despite the fact that the tuition can be quite comparable. And I, I knew what I was signing up for with tuition. I knew that going into it. What I didn't know were those small things like textbooks that you absolutely have to have. And, um, so that was a that was a bit of a blow, uh, and this really kind of I'm going to get on my soapbox here for a second. Law school should be accessible. Law school should be accessible to people of all walks of life, and this is not me speaking ill of the affluent. I hope someday to count myself amongst <laughs> them. But uh, truly, truly, the the problem is that when you create. A, a venue, you create an area where you have only like-minded people from only like-minded backgrounds, you breed extremism. And I have this idea of a better lawyer tomorrow. And the, 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 it's almost the loans and the necessity to take out more loans and the rates are almost usury. Mm. So casebooks are extortion. Mm. Now the casebooks themselves, Today seems like a great day to make enemies. So listen to this next statement and see how many of my friends I lose. One L's must read full cases. I know the one L's of the, of the Twitterverse are gonna hate that, but even court opinions are broken up more than case books. Sometimes I wonder if case book authors just throw up in their laptops. You know, they're like, we'll figure that out because it's just text and text and text and you don't, see all of the components and pieces of the case. And oftentimes you don't get the full analysis. You just get this really watered down version and it's not doing you any favors as a law student. And the problem with the, ca the case book is you're really in a bind because you don't know what parts of the case are going to be produced in the case book. So if you wanted to say, I won't buy the case book, I'll look up the cases on Westlaw well, the Socratic method is a bit of a double-edged sword because you want to walk into class fully prepared for whatever the professor is going to ask. And what they're going to ask is what is on the casebook and might not necessarily be in the text that was in Westlaw. Mm. So 
once again, you're forced to buy the text. So yeah, that's, that's kind of my feelings on <laughs> traditional case books. Okay. Okay. So Estee, you know, what makes, what makes a, a law school case book, a textbook good? Right? How do you distinguish between ones that you have found effective and ones that you've found less effective? Pictures. <laughs> no, pictures. Okay, so quick sidebar. Uh, when I was in college, I actually broke up with this guy uh, because I thought he was really, really smart because he said that chemistry was his favorite uh, subject. And then I found out that he liked chemistry because there were pictures in the book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but no, honestly, I, there's, I'm going to keep coming back to this, but there's this one case book uh, that I read. It was my Civ Pro book that was absolutely brilliant. It was about 20 chapters. So lots <laughs> yeah. of chapters. You actually, you actually sent me your book, which I found absolutely charming. I did. I did. But it was so brilliant because law school is one test, one grade model. So it's really difficult as the year progresses to test your knowledge and to really engage in active learning. And so what this guy did was he broke everything down into small components. And once he presented an idea, he then gave you a hypothetical with a question and then the explanation and the answer. Uh, so it was just fantastic. That was a really good case book. On the flip side, I had certain case books that were literally nothing but cases. And it kind of goes back to my original point. Why, why did I buy this? It's available on Westlaw, you know? Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, no, I totally hear you. I totally hear you. So my last question for you before you take over the interview is what do you think about open source case books? What do you think about open access when it comes to educational materials for, for law students? This podcast brought to you by open source case books. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Brian, tell me what are open source case books? Um, so open source case books is just a way of recognizing that there's no reason for us to ask law students to pay for this material, right? I mean, as law professors, we produce all of our scholarship for the public for free. We make it available to the public for free. And yet for some inexplicable, well, not that inexpl inexplicable reason, right? We ask our students to pay hundreds of dollars for books that consist entirely of material that's either public domain or produced by law professors without receiving any meaningful real compensation for it. And there's no reason, right? I mean, we're just taxing our students for the benefit of commercial publishers. And, and I think it's shameful. I really do. And so I think that we should be providing all of that material to our students for free and open access case, case books are the way to make that we don't make that possible, right? And there's a lot of providers that are facilitating the ability of law professors to give their students open access case books. And there are open access case books available in most areas that we're teaching in. So, you know, if there's one already out there, you should assign it, in my opinion. And if there isn't one out there, you should write one or somebody should write one or you should collaborate with people to write one because, you know, we don't need to be making our students pay thousands and thousands of dollars a year for educational materials. Oh, hold up. I want to touch on, you said something about compensation and you made it sound a little bit paltry mm -hmm. on the end. So professors, the, the general conception from the student body is that when we purchase a textbook that is published by a professor, especially the one teaching the class, that he's getting a kickback. He's getting uh, compensation for that. Are you telling me that it's not a, can you give me some figures? What would you Yeah, I mean, I, well, I have never personally uh, made a contract with a commercial publisher because I think it's repulsive. Um, but but I know plenty of people who have, you know, 
who have take, made that compromise. And in general, the amount of compensation is paltry at best, right? I mean, people joke about how small the checks they get from commercial publishers are. And, you know, students are paying hundreds of dollars for textbooks, but the authors are receiving uh, peanuts in exchange for that. So, I mean, it's, it's true that it's true that casebook authors like professors are assigning their own books and hoping other people assign their books, but it's not because they're getting paid for it. Right. I mean, the, the coin of the scholarly realm is not money. It's, it's prestige. And so what casebook authors, what professors really care about is people using their material, not what they get paid for it. So let me get this straight. Open source case books are free. Yeah. You put hours and hours and hours into creating this open source case book and now it's free. Mm -hmm. Are you insane? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm definitely insane. Yes. <laughs> I mean, th there's no question about that. I think anyone you ask would tell you that I'm totally bonkers, but, right. I, I but yes, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yes, of course. Right. I mean, okay. of course I, I, you know, it's everything I do is free, right? I mean, I believe in free. I do what I do because I love to do it. And I'm fortunate enough that I have a job that lets me do whatever I like, whenever I like, for whatever reason I like. No. So why wouldn't I do it for free? Okay. You know I'm a business finance person. That's that's my realm. That's my interest. And I'll tell you, it's been a long-standing business principle that people value the things they pay for. Are you concerned that because these are free, this will cause people to believe that they're not good or not legitimate? I think last we spoke, I kind of talked a little bit about that Wikipedia model and how it mm. was very well respected in the beginning until it wasn't. Mm, mm. Yeah, so I've I've heard this from some people you know that there are there is a way in which some students a small percent well hopefully a small percentage of students but i don't know maybe a large percentage of students sort of evaluate things based on how things are done you know or their perception of how things are done and if something isn't how it's done, then they think it's bad. And I've actually had people say to me that there have been students who look down on course materials because they didn't have to pay for them because they kind of expected to pay for them. And they just kind of assumed that if they weren't paying, it couldn't possibly be good. I mean, honestly, I, I get I get that that's a phenomenon, but it's so pathetic <laughs> that, I, <laughs> that I can't take it seriously, you know, and I'm sorry, you know, if people are idiots, then that's on them, you know? I mean, like, I don't treat this any differently than I would if it were being paid for. And honestly, I would never do a case book for a commercial publisher. The only reason I'm willing to put the time and energy into it is because I can give them the middle finger, you know? And yeah. I, 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 I mean, I, I want the materials I produce to be good because I want to give the middle finger to the people who are screwing students over, you know? And I hired you because you had ideas about good ideas about how to make the material better, you know, and I, I really appreciated your perspective on what I was trying to do and your thoughts on how I could do it better. Right. So, I mean, from my perspective, right. I mean, making things free is my motivation 
<laughs> you know, that's the only reason I care. I mean, like I could just be focusing on my own scholarship and doing things that actually benefited me personally. But instead, I've been investing a lot of time in producing open source materials for which I get no credit, right? I mean, like this stuff does nothing for me on tenure and promotion. It does nothing for me in any kind of formal institutional way because I'm doing it for precisely because I'm doing it for free. But I just don't care. You know, I mean... <laughs> I hear you. So uh, to conclude side A of the LP, we'll, we'll bring two points to the conclusion. Mm. Number one, I'm amazing. You are correct. Thank you. Uh, number two, there you have it, listeners. Brian Fry, rebel with a cause. <laughs> <laughs> Causes, right? I think, right. <laughs> right? Like when you say like, you know, like what, <laughs> you, 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 you ask me like, he asked me what what Apple card I want to overturn, and I just got to say, like, what do you got, right? I mean, yeah. like, I, I can't help myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I feel like, can you edit in, like, a record scratch right here? Because I think that would be really cool. I, I absolutely can. That would be awesome. Okay. So let's jump into side B. This is the part I'm really excited about, inside the mind of a law professor. We have three sets of questions here. The first are mine. The second are from Duquesne Law students. And the third are from the Twitterverse. Okay. So I'll launch right in. Brian, what is your favorite part about your job? Mm. And don't say open source case books. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, I mean, I think the interestingly, I was, I think like the hardest question would be like what don't I like about my job because I mean being a law professor at least for me is like the greatest thing that ever happened in my entire life Aww. right I mean like I get to spend all day every day just doing whatever it is that I love you know, and especially the last couple of years um, where, you know, not only has the job been great, right, but now that I've gotten tenure and I'm moving forward to being promoted to being a full professor, I, I can really just do whatever I want to, you know, and like, especially this last year where I've been, you know, doing a lot of interviews with other academics and other people about their own work. I mean, it's just really struck home to me the way in which this is a job where I'm tasked with just doing good and interesting things, you know, and that is a huge it's a blessing. It really is. You know, I mean, like my job is just, is just to be interesting and help people. And the main thing for me, I think the hard thing for a lot of people is to remember the help people part, because it's really easy to think that this is about me and I deserve it. And I try to remember that this is about other people and they deserve my help. Well, I can personally attest you have already helped me so much. And I have to say that leads me perfectly into my second question. So the PA bar results were recently posted and there was this outpouring of commendation from the faculty in my corner of the world. Mm. Do you experience pride when your students succeed? Hell yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god no i mean like i live for my students you know and i'm so happy when they're successful and i'm especially happy when the ones who question themselves are are successful and i love working with students you know it makes me so happy when i see the kentucky bar results come out and my students are lawyers it's like it's the it's such a great, I'm, you know, it really makes me so happy. 
to see their success. When I see my students succeed as lawyers, it's huge for me. You know, I mean, I've been a law professor for, geez, like a little over 10 years now. And I'm still in touch with law students I had the first year I I was teaching. And, you know, it 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 makes me so proud to see the successes that those students had, you know, 10 years ago. Um, you know, the students I had 10 years ago, like the successes that they're having now. And I'm actually, you know, I'm working with one of them on a amicus brief. You know, yes. I, had, I had another student, my very first research assistant at the University of Kentucky, CJ Ryan, is now a law professor. And that was like one of the most exciting, happy moments for me when CJ became a law professor, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, those are the moments that make me feel like I'm doing something right. And, you know, this is, this is good. And I'm making a difference. You know, I posted on Twitter a few weeks back that law professors must be protected at all costs. And that's pretty much why right there. That's (laughs) awesome. So into the classroom, Mm. what are your thoughts on the Socratic method? Why do we still do this? Well, okay, so I'm not a fan of the sort of hard Socratic method in the sort of like hide the ball and, you know, don't tell the students where you're trying to go sort of method. Um, I do think asking questions of students is valuable and productive. So I do like a like ultra light Socratic in my class, you know, where Um, like typically I'll ask students about like, well, what happened? And, you know, like, you know, you know, why did the court do that? And why did the court say it was doing that? But, but I think that that's important because I think it's hard for students sometimes to sort of remember, you need to encourage students to look at the facts and think about the facts because students want law school to be math and the law isn't math and it makes them mad that it's not (laughs) math. (laughs) Right. So, so like for me, like this quote unquote Socratic method is really just a way of forcing students to like engage with the reality of what's happening, which is that, you know, and I'm a legal realist, right? I mean, the courts know what outcome they want to reach and they use the law to get there, right? And so the Socratic method is a way of forcing students to like wrestle with the reality that the facts matter and the courts are deciding questions on, they're deciding cases on the basis of the facts, you know? not some like big picture principles in most cases. And so, you know, you need to engage with those facts and understand what facts matter and why in order to make sense of what's really taking place and sort of put the law that you're reading into a bigger picture context, which is to my mind, what the whole point of of classes. So like, you know, like I say, I do a a kind of ultra light Socratic in the sense that, you know, I ask questions to like, ask the students to just remember, like, what are we talking about here? Right? Because I know this stuff inside and out, right? I live this shit, right? (laughs) (laughs) But they don't, right? And so I just want them to like, to like realize like, oh, I got to like sort of internalize what's happening here and make sense of it in my head in order to figure out what we're talking about, right? So you're I trying want, to narrow I, the focus. Yeah, I want, them to, I want them to get to the place where they can be part of the conversation. That's, 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 that's it, right? And so for me, it's not about like grilling students, right? Like, I mean, every class, I have students who come in and they, they come to me before class and they're like, I'm sorry, I didn't do the reading this week. I'm like, dude, I don't care. 
right? Whatever, right? Or they're like, I have to leave. You know, I'm like, whatever. You know, it's not my problem. Like, do you get to do, man? You're a grown up, right? <laughs> right? But I mean, or, you know, I call on someone and be like, hey, you know, so like what happened? And they're like, oh, I didn't do the, I'm like, that's fine. You know, it's no problem. I don't care if you didn't do the reading. It's like, that's not the point. It doesn't matter if you did the reading. We're just having a conversation and I'll just talk to someone else who did read the case and can help get us to the, but like, I, I, it's like, it's just a conversation starter. That's all it is. So quick sidebar, I'm going to tell uh, this really cute Socratic method story from mm. the beginning of my 1L year. Because, mm. uh, of course, I talk to a ton of 1Ls now, and it's, it's so cool being a 2L and getting to talk to them uh, because they all ask the questions like, oh, my God, are they going to grill you in class? And like, of course, they're going to beat you in the center. That's what they do. Uh, but the, the reality is uh, one day, and in the beginning, you're, you're doing the matchy-matchy with words, right? Because so much of the lingo is new, so you're trying to just recognize repetitive terms. And I had this one professor, he's just freaking brilliant. And he said, SJ, what was the procedural posture? And I had heard procedural history up to this mm. point. And so I was like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> and he, was so, he was so great because mm. he said, what happened in the case before it got here? And it was just so, it was mm. such a cool moment because yeah. what I was expecting was for him to go on to the next student and be like, well, so you're dumb. And then, but he mm. didn't, you know, it was mm. just this great dialogue. Very cool. Mm. So, mm. Like, still, yeah. Still in the classroom, uh, law school, it's a one exam, one entire course grade model. Why do we do this? Yeah. Well, okay. So, I mean, I don't believe in grades in the first <laughs> place. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like I didn't take this job because I wanted to be a cop. Yeah. And I still don't want to be a cop and I don't like cops. Um, and so the grading thing just sucks. And it's my least favorite part of being a law professor that said, you know, we're obligated to do it, you know, and we give grades for employers for better or for worse. Right. Yep. It's like a proxy for them to pick which students they want to hire and which students they don't. And I think that sucks and is stupid. But, you know, to the extent that I can give grades that help students understand whether they're, whether they're succeeding in understanding the material or not, I think that that is actually potentially valuable okay so um, then yeah so i mean like so uh, like I, I don't love the one grade at the end of the course thing but i see it as sort of obligatory and also just like a i'm going to put together an exam that hopefully is a learning experience as well and I'll give you a grade that hopefully reflects to the best of my ability, you know, my assessment of what you've learned in the class. But precisely for that reason, right, I've adopted an exam strategy that's a little different from other law professors. Don't mention the stairs. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, I and then oh. um, the, the, the 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 stairs thing is a <laughs> hilarious joke, right? I mean, yeah, like throw the exams down the stairs and see what happens. I mean, you know, I mean, honestly, it, as, assessing, I, I'll, and I'll be blunt, right? I mean, assessing law school exams is really hard, but I'm not sure I'm that good at it. I'm not sure any of us are all that good at it, and I, you know, and I, I think that's true for like the bar examiners as well. Right. I mean, the reality is that like the only reason <clears throat> we take any of these people seriously and accept their assessments is that you're not allowed to question them or even kind of like look into the inputs that that they're making. Right. I mean, I do my best to grade exams objectively and carefully, but I would be mortified if someone were to like second guess or like check my assessments i'd probably be wrong in a lot mm. of cases and that's kind of embarrassing for me i hate to admit it 
you know, but like I give grades. I think in many cases, my grades are probably not right. You know, I give the wrong, I'm sure I've given the wrong grade in an objective sense in, in many cases. And that's hard for me to accept, but it's hard for me to accept because I don't want to be a cop. I don't want to be given grades in the first place. You know, I, I think the grades suck and I think it sucks that that's something we're expected to do. But regardless, right? I mean, my feeling about law school exams is that like one of the biggest problems with law school exams in a traditional sense is that they're not actually, A, they're not testing something that lawyers actually need to do, yeah. and B, they're not learning experiences, right? So traditional law school exams are like BS, like issue spotter, you know, puke your knowledge onto the page type. And I just, I just think that's a total waste of time. It's not, it, it's not actually assessing anything that we meaningfully care about. It's not assessing your ability to be a good lawyer and it's not a learning experience. So instead what I do in all of my classes now is I give my students a real world problem. So typically like a complaint or like a dispute that's actually happening. And I tell them, you know, you're a associate at a law firm or you're a law clerk working for a judge and the partner or the judge wants you to explain to them how they should think about this problem, right? Presented by this particular case. So, you know, write up a memo explaining to them how they should think about the issue that's for them. You know, you've got a thousand words maximum and three weeks or so usually to work on. I usually give my students about three weeks to write their exams and they're open universe, right? So they can like, they can look at anything, they can read anything and they can talk to anyone, right? And I tell them in class, I'm like, you should go talk to the law librarians right? Law librarians know a lot about the law, right? That's their job. They're really good at this, right? They can help you figure out how to answer these questions, right? You should talk to each other, right? I mean, uh, you know, I'm posing a question to you. I want you to chew over the question and talk about it with your classmates, right? Because the goal for me of class is, is learning, right? I mean, my... <laughs> Right? I mean, what I, the key thing I want to achieve in my classes is, is learning. And to my mind, anything that promotes learning is something that I want to accomplish, uh, that I want to encourage, right? So, I, 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 you know, I mean, like, does it help learning for students to talk to each other about problems? Of course it does, right? Well, so any kind of exam that prevents students from talking to each other to my mind is a bad exam or it's a bad format because it inhibits learning right i mean my my only desired outcome is is learning right and so i want to have an exam format that's part of the learning experience of the class and that promotes learning rather than just sorting students for employers because like i said like i didn't take this job to be a cop and i don't want to be a cop so quick devil's advocate and i am in no way supporting this approach but if you think about your standard law school exam you've got three hours you sit in a room and you type as much as you can mm. That is a pressure cooker because I mean, because you can't have a bad day. That cannot be the day that you have a bad day. That's your mm. entire grade. Mm. So it could be testing your ability to perform under pressure. What are your thoughts on that? Let's see, I mean, I, I mean, yeah, but is that really what we value? I mean, I don't think so, right? I mean, I guess like. As a lawyer, it's like I had bad days too, but that didn't make me a bad lawyer, you know? Well, my, I mean, my perspective on it is I don't know how applicable that is to the real world. 
even if you think about it from like a litigator's sense, I, I recognize that litigators are, are slaves of the calendar and they have to do a lot of hearings. And so you have to be prepared on the day that you go in and you do a hearing, but you typically have X number of days to prepare and do exactly what you said of doing earlier, collaborating, talking mm. to people, doing the research, doing the writing. Um, so I just don't see how it's applicable to the real world. Yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 I think that's right. You know, and, and, and I think the real issue is that I, I, like I said, like, I think the goal of law school should be to teach people how to learn and how to think about the law. And so to the extent that I'm willing to evaluate my students, I want to evaluate them on the basis of to what extent they put in the effort to learn. And okay. so I want to give them an evaluation tool that's designed to assess their learning, not an evaluation tool that's designed to assess, I don't know what, I mean, performance under pressure. Yeah. Performance under pressure. I mean, I just don't think that's the point, you know, I don't, and I don't understand why it, I, I, I can't see why it should be the point. Right. And, <clears throat> and so, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm just much happier. I, I'm much more comfortable with an approach to teaching and to evaluating that's student-centered rather than employer-centered, oh. right? As far as I'm concerned, em, you know, if employers want to sort students, they can do that on their own fucking dime, and I don't have to do it for <laughs> them. Um, on that note, uh, you've been teaching for 10 years, you said, right? Mm, yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in your experience... <clears throat> Is there any correlation between classroom engagement and the final grade? Oh, big time. What? Yeah, I mean, big time. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that students who are paying attention and engaging in class tend to do well. Students who are not paying attention and not engaging in class tend not to do well. Now, that said, um, there are always students there's always a certain kind of student who quote unquote engages a lot in class without actually learning anything. It's usually a guy, I'm sad to say, and, <laughs> and he usually says things that don't make any sense very confidently. <clears throat> and that student in my experience, tends to do very poorly. Because... Oh my God, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, it's definitely not you. Um, but no, there is this student. There's this, like this student I've had so many times over the years who's incredibly confident in their ignorance. It's like Dunn-Kruger <laughs> on display where I'm just like, oh my God, please stop. Like, like, this is not, this is, like, I want engagement, but this is not helpful, and you are modeling bad behavior in class. Is there coaches. hope, then? Is there hope for our shy students? <laughs> <clears throat> no, I mean, like, look, shy students, I mean, I, I totally get it. Like, that was not me. I will confess, it was not me. Like, I mean, I was definitely the student who was like, you know, I didn't talk all the time, but like, I was a student who was like, if something bothered me, I would raise my hand and be like, this bothers me, you know, for X, Y, Z reasons. You know, I know that there are a lot of students who are uncomfortable talking in class and who feel shy. And I know that there are dynamics among students that make people feel that that way and and i that's the part i really dislike right so if i could do anything it would be to tell the cabal of the sort of law student social police to shut the fuck up right like law students don't need cops either and they should mind their own business in my opinion you know and i really i really don't i really am 
disturbed by the law students who shame their yes. classmates who are excited about what they're learning. I think it's really sad and pathetic and I think they should grow up. And it really, it just damages the learning environment. I mean, oh. in my experience, the minute that doubt enters my mind is the minute that learning stops. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I was, I, I, yeah, I feel like I was, I was fortunate because I didn't go to law school and didn't start law school until I was 27. So, you know, I wasn't that old, but I was a little bit older than my, than my classmates. And so I just kind of ignored them and didn't care <laughs> what they thought. And I'm pretty confident that a lot of them thought I was a total lunatic, which was probably true. Um, but, but it was like, it was nicely, it was liberating in the sense that I just kind of didn't pay attention to law school culture, you know, and I also had a lot of friends outside of law school. So, you know, I didn't need to be a law student all the time. I just went to law school for law school and that was it. And then I did other stuff during the day. And, you know, it, 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 it let me kind of make law school my own rather than, rather than sort of playing the same game as my classmates. Okay, quick public service announcement to our listeners. Going into law school at 27 does not make you old. Uh. <laughs> you. Well, okay, okay, but, but SJ, <laughs> SJ, my first, my first day of law school, I will never forget. So, so this is back in the day when they still like, like law student boxes and stuff. And I went to my box and I had a targeted flyer from the older but wiser law students. Yes. I was like, seriously? I'm fucking 27. I mean, <laughs> that makes me older but wiser. And like, honestly, now I'm, I'm turning 45 this year. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, wis the wisdom is still elusive. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have not found it yet. I mean, some, some, someday I may be wise, but I think it's going to be a while yet. <laughs> so I do have this next question in the queue, mm. but I think you kind of answered it. Mm. I was going to ask, what is something you wish students would stop doing? And it sounds to me like you wish they would stop freaking bullying each other. Mm. Well, for 100%. The other thing, and this is maybe kind of heretical, but I really wish students would stop outlining. It's a fucking waste of time. Oh my um, god! I mean, outlining classes is like writing book reports, right? I mean, it's just it's just such a waste of time. You know, I mean, all that material is available, pre-printed elsewhere. There's no reason to spend your time on it, and you're not learning anything. You know, I mean, my position is that if you want to learn you need to do things that are hard and the reason students outline is because it's easy right the hard thing is actually answering questions and thinking about problems and outlining is a way of, of avoiding that right so my advice to students is really stop outlining and start wrestling with real problems and real questions and thinking about how you would answer them and actually doing it, right? Because that's yes. hard. That's hard yes. and you don't wanna do it, but that's, that's why you should be doing it. No, I hear you, I absolutely hear you. And that kind of was about my gripe about the case books was they mm. just blah, here's a case and then there's nothing in there to engage. Mm -hmm. There's no way to, anyway, I digress. Mm. Mm. So this, this one should be fun. What's your opinion of teacher assessments completed by students? You read them? <laughs> yeah, I, I avoid them. Um, oh, God, I love these. <laughs> I, I avoid them because they're hurtful. <laughs> Although most of my really? assessments, I mean, most of my, uh, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be honest. Like, look, I'm a white dude. Like, most of my assessments are pretty good, right? But the problem, <laughs> what? Yeah, it, it, you know, it, they're they're super racist. They're super sexist, right? I oh. mean, who gives bad assessments? It's white dudes. Are they right? really? Oh yeah, 
Oh yeah. I had no. no idea. Okay, oh, so, no. My, dude, my, dude, my dude. Yeah. Hmm? My thought was just that the students that struggled in class are going to give you a shitty review. No. I never correlated mm -hmm. any of that with any kind of race, gender. I oh. are you serious? Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. No, I mean, like the, I mean, both research and personal experience and anecdote are they're all very clear that that student assessments are incredibly biased and incredibly racist and incredibly sexist and it's it's really bad and it's it's shameful that we include them in our assessment of professors because they're not representative and and I'll be honest like I mean I buy it I I mean I I, I benefit from this right because you know I I get the benefit of being a white dude from a fancy school you know and so you know students look at me and they're inclined the the students who are most likely to give bad reviews are also the most likely to give me the benefit of the doubt and the only reason they dislike me is because i'm always saying things that seem wrong <laughs> to them <laughs> right but but you know no i mean assessments are student assessments are are, are terrible I, I we should not we should be asking students about their experience but we should not be taking them literally in my opinion. I, I have to say i really appreciate your candor that was very instructive for me mm. um and enraging and, and sad yeah um, no i mean it's it's fucked up it's super fucked up but it's very very clear that student assessments are not accurate assessments of teaching quality and it it is to my mind depressing and shameful that they are treated as if they were any meaningful assessment of teaching quality because they're not. So I'm going to move into my last question. This is my last question. Uh, showing my cards a little bit here, showing a little bit of vulnerability. What I'm asking is from the student's perspective, law school can be extremely daunting. It can often feel like an inside joke everyone is in on but you because much of the terminology is new professors use it in such a natural way when speaking due to experience, thereby creating the illusion that students should inherently know all of the language and what results is this increase in fear of asking a dumb question. Furthermore, I have yet to meet a law professor who isn't accomplished, so the disparity in academic caliber is stark, making law professors naturally intimidating because it breeds the concern in the student's mind of will I ever reach that level? Will I ever be enough? What do you do to reduce student anxiety in this regard? Mm, mm, mm. Well, so I mean, I, I totally get what you're asking there. And I try to let students know that, you know, what we're doing isn't rocket science, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's like, yeah, there's a lot of weird t terminology that doesn't make sense. But at the end of the day, it's real world questions and real world problems. You know, I'm not always, I'm not always perfect about it, you know, and occasionally like I like everyone else get frustrated by, mm -hmm. by certain students and I'm not proud about that, you know, and like, I, and I admit that I've like snapped on a couple of occasions and just been like, please stop, <laughs> you know, but, but at the same time, you know, I want students to ask questions and I, I love it when students say, I don't get it. Like what's going on. Right. Like what's happening here? Why is the court doing this? Why are they saying that? Because the, the, the reality is, and I think a lot of students don't realize this, is that 90% of what courts say is bullshit. Right. I mean, they're just, they're, they're spitting out a lot of words, but they don't actually mean anything. Right. I mean, they're just justifying whatever result 
they want to arrive at. You Further know? justifying my point that one else need to read full cases. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, what, 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 100%, you know, I mean, like, I, I totally agree with you that like, it actually is really valuable to sort of read through judicial opinions in their totality, but also to think about them in, in context and not like, look, I feel like a lot of students assume that courts are always right. Yeah. You know? And I want them to know that like, just because the, just because a court says something, just because the Supreme court says something doesn't mean that it's right. <laughs> right. We're entitled to question what they say and why they say it. And you shouldn't just accept whatever it is that comes out of the judge's mouth is being true. Judges are just people, just like law professors are just people, right? I mean, the fact that I said something certainly doesn't mean that it's right. In fact, the fact that I said something is probably prima facie evidence that it's bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So, I, I mean, like, you know, I, I just don't, uh, I want my students to know that I want to hear from them, you know, and there's like, there's no wrong answers. Right. So like, what do I try to do? I try, I try, I try, I try to just say to my students, like, look, I'm going to ask you a question. If you don't know the answer, I can help you get there. Right. If you don't remember what happened in the case, I'll tell you, right? And then we can answer the question together, right? If I'm asking for your opinion, I mean it. I want to know what your opinion is, right? If I'm asking you to say what you think about something, I'm not asking you to like tell me what the court said. I'm asking you to think about the question and say how you think that actually makes sense in the real world, you know? And like, like what 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 kinds of results should we be reaching and why should we be reaching them? I mean, like this is an opportunity to engage in critical engage in critical thinking and to like critically engage with ideas and the politics of the questions we're talking about. And you know, don't, don't feel scared about that. that. That's my main thing is like, I don't want my students to be scared of me. That's awesome. That, uh, seriously, Brian, like there's a real beauty in that. That, that, that truly, truly. And I can only speak as a Duquesne law student, but something that continually floors me, I, you know, like I said, I can only speak as a Duquesne student, mm. uh, is how kind the faculty is. I, mm. I never expect it in, in a professional setting. And this is my, this is my opinion. Uh, I believe that cordiality is absolutely necessary, but I don't mm. believe that kindness is. And, mm. and the fact that the law professors in my experience have been so yeah. kind. Yeah. Just, well, you do have some, you do have some amazing people in the faculty. Hurry like up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fan of Richard and Aman. <laughs> and a bunch of other people yeah. on your faculty. So, you know, consider me a Duquesne booster. To, to quote the great philosopher, DJ Khaled, we the best. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Indeed, indeed. So speaking of Duquesne, I've got some questions from the Duquesne law students. Okay. The first one is, what have you learned as a teacher about being a student? Yeah, that's that's actually kind of a a deep question. Bro. And and in in a weird way, I feel like it's actually uh, I think the main thing I've learned as a teacher about students is that I have to remind myself that I'm a teacher all the time and that awesome. my my experience is not their experience, right? It's like, for me, I think the most important thing to remember, it's like that, that Matthew McConaughey uh, line from Days and Confused, right? Like, you know, every year I, I, every year I get older, but they, <laughs> but they, they stay the same age, yeah. right? Yeah. It's like, I have to remind myself that 
uh, my thinking changes and deepens and develops every year, but my students are always law students and they're always at the same place. And I need to put myself in their shoes. Rather Just to clarify, you said lost students, right? Law, yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> right. <clears throat> so I, I mean, I, I need to put myself in their shoes rather than in my own. And I need to be speaking to them rather than speaking to myself. And well, so, I mean, I, I really think for me, like that's the hardest thing to remember as a teacher, because I, I can get out in the weeds real fast, real easy. And I need to remind myself that that's not helping my students. Well, I wear a nine and a half, five inch heel stiletto. You're welcome to borrow them anytime. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask, do you ever see yourself in a student? Um, well, I mean, yes and no, right? I mean, there's certainly students who, there's some students I identify with more than others and i think that's just you can't help it you yeah. know and like i will confess that the students i identify with are the students who i'm especially um motivated to try to help in any way that i can um i will say that like to see my i mean like i'm SC, I'm pretty weird. You don't <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, to literally see myself in a student, I mean, ooh, wow, yeah. I mean, I would be delighted, but um, I, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah a little sorry I asked. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just don't feel like there are that many students who are exactly like me going to law school in the first place yeah. um well, it's but i would encourage i mean i encourage them all the time i mean i will say anecdotally so i i have a lot of friends who teach in the school of um uh visual arts here at uk and i go in and do a copyright lecture every semester in my friend rob souther's photography class and um i hope that you know maybe someday some of those photography art students will come to law school you know because i was an art student before i went to law school you know and uh, you know i think that that influenced my approach to being a law student and being a law professor um oh. but we don't have enough art students in law school you know, I mean, as far as far as I know, there's only well, I know of I know of two others. So my good friend Sarah Burstein, who is the preeminent authority on design patents and one of my favorite legal scholars, she was a art school design student as an undergrad, and um Jennifer Rothman, who is the preeminent scholar on on the right of publicity and an absolutely delightful person and really interesting thinker, she actually, like me, did an MFA in in filmmaking. But as far as I know, those are like the only two other kind of law professor artists out there. And I really think it would be great to have more in our club. So you practiced before teaching. Mm -hmm. What are the pros and cons of teaching versus practice? Mm, uh, well, I mean, for me, practice, well, for me, pra teaching, being a law professor is, like I said, the greatest thing ever. <laughs> practice was good experience yeah. in some ways. I, I can't be 100% positive about practice i mean in part because i kind of didn't have the best experience 
across the board. You know, so I, I practiced at Sullivan and Cromwell for about two and a half years. Um, some of the partners I worked for at Sullivan and Cromwell were really kind and generous and good mentors and others were flaming assholes. Um, and I mostly worked for flaming assholes. <laughs> so like, for example, you know, uh, I'll never forget. Like, so I had a, a, a junior, uh, a, another associate who'd flaked on a project asked me or told me to write, a brief tomorrow for tomorrow that he had been sitting on for two weeks. Right. And so, you know, I stayed up all night writing this, this motion, this, this brief and, you know, put it on the, put it on the partner's desk in the morning. And about 30 minutes later, I got it back and there was one mark and it was like page 17 or something, right? He had circled a, a misplaced apostrophe. And oh. on the cover of the brief, it said, do you speak English? <gasps> <laughs> so for me, that was like kind of, that kind of defined my practice experience. I was yeah. like, that's that's like not helpful, man. Wow. You know, like I don't really want to be like, a, you're paying me well, but it's not really worth it to hmm. me, you know? Okay. So, but, 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 but I mean, that's like not, there are plenty of other kinds of practice experience that can be positive and valuable. And, you know, I just think it's like people got to, people got to do what's right for them. I will say that like when it comes to law school hiring, there is a certain subset of people who really push for practice experience in in hiring and I I really disagree with that, especially in the current market. I mean, I certainly don't discount the value of practice experience but i i also don't think that that's a valid reason to question somebody's ability to be a good professor i think there's a lot of different ways to be a good teacher practice is one of them but there are plenty of others and i i i really don't think that we should be questioning people's fitness to be legal academics on the basis of whether or not they practiced. So returning to the happy place of academia, mm -hmm. I have one last question from the Duquesne Law students. Mm -hmm. What do you wish students asked you more about? Well, okay, I, I think from my perspective, the main thing that I wish students talk to me about is how I can help them. Right, because yeah. I see my job as helping my students, like the fundamental job as helping my students. And I feel like my students are not good at telling me what they need. Right? So I will need a letter of recommendation. I'm glad yeah. that you asked. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. I be SJ, the, the letter is writing itself. It will be <laughs> It will be such an easy letter to write. It's fine. I'll write it. You sign it. We'll, it'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So into the Twitterverse, when and how did you know you wanted to be a professor? Okay. So this is, this is actually an awesome question. Um, and all of this was totally bonkers. Like, so I went to law school totally by accident, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it was my my girlfriend at the time. <laughs> I love this was, story. <laughs> was was interested in. She was always talking about going to law school, and so I went out and like bought 
LSAT books and everything. And we took the LSAT together. And I mean, it was like, it was not even really my idea, but then I was like, oh, geez, like this, this makes sense. Like this Bra, is something. Listen, I have been married for five years and I have never loved my husband enough to willfully study for and take something like the LSAT. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I had strong, I had strong feelings for her. She was a, she was a very nice girl, and I'm, you know, and she's been very successful in her subsequent career, and I am very happy for her. She did not go to law school, and that was probably all the best for her, right? So I went, I went to law school by accident, you know, and like, and I didn't really under, I, I don't think it, like my take on it was like a normal take. You know, so I was like, oh, I'm going to law school. So I went and looked up the Harvard Law School, like recommended le reading list and just bought all the books on the list and read them, you know, including like, you know, Holmes's The Common Law and, <laughs> and Llewellyn's Bramblebush and so on, like the summer before I started law school and I was like, I just treated it like any other kind of graduate school. I was just like, this will be fun. Let's see what happens, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, I don't even know what it means to be a lawyer, but this should be fun and interesting. And, you know, so I started it at Georgetown law school and my civil procedure professor was uh, Naomi Mezzi. And I actually did kind of mediocre <laughs> in her class. I got a B plus, which is really not terribly oh, impressive, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? But, oh but she really liked me. And she asked me to be her research assistant on a paper she was working on because it was about um it was about film studies it was about movies and wow. she that was not her area of expertise and you know that that's what i studied as an undergrad and i worked as like a film maker programmer etc uh, journalist for a long time so i helped her for a semester as her research assistant. And then she actually wrote me a letter of recommendation to transfer to, to NYU, which I did not for any good reason, but only because my girlfriend at the time was in New York and wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't move to DC. <laughs> it worked out really well. I mean, NYU was fantastic. I was sad to leave Georgetown, among other things, because I didn't get to hang out with Naomi more. Um, but in any case, many, several years later, after I'd finished clerking and whatnot, I found myself in DC again. And I, you know, I dropped by Georgetown and visited Naomi. And she said to me, like, totally casually in passing, she said, obviously, you're going to be a law professor. And I was like, Oh, wait, wait, what? <laughs> but she was right, right? And so it was total. it was 100% her, you know? And I had never occurred to me that that was what I would do. But she was right. I mean, I was obviously that that was the right path for me. I mean, I kind of took a circuitous route and didn't do everything the right way. But, you know, like her read was spot on. So what advice would you give to law students about how to spend their time while they're in law school? Mm. Meaning law review, alternative career exploration, bar review courses, engagement with the bar, mm. volunteerism. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that really depends on the student. You know, I mean, I, I think the main thing law students need to recognize is, <clears throat> is that everything you do in law school is a reflection of and reflects on what you're doing and why you're doing it, you know? Well, and so you shouldn't do things because you feel obligated to right? You should do things because they're bringing value to, you know, and like, and there's two ways to think about that, right? I mean, 
there are certain kinds of things you can do that will just look good on your resume, right? So like being on Law Review or whatever, like that looks good on your resume. It's fine just for that reason alone. Right, but, but more deeply, I think that law students should ask themselves, what can I do that's gonna help me achieve the goals that I want to achieve? Like, don't just tick off the boxes, ask yourself, how can I learn more? How can I learn more? And how can I show that I've learned more? Right, so like one thing I always would encourage law students to do is, I mean, and this it should be really obvious, but I'm going to say it, right? Do a fucking independent study, right? I mean, like, A, it means you're going to produce a piece of writing that is something you can use as a writing sample. B, it means you're going to get an automatic A, right? Every <laughs> student, every student who does an independent study with me Get, the only grade I give for independent study is A, <laughs> right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Period. It's always an A <laughs> because I can give whatever grade I want. It's not curved. So it's an A. It's always an A, right? So do the fucking independent study. Plus, right, if you really put effort into it and try hard, your professor will be impressed by you. And we'll be delighted to write you a letter and like know who you are because they've had time to talk to you and learn about your ideas, et cetera, et cetera. So like the independent study thing, I mean, I'm seriously like you're nuts if you don't do that. I, um, that was a good answer. I'm not really sure I got how you feel about independent studies, but we'll go ahead and move on to the next question. <laughs> no, I love it. And I, I'm limited. I'm limited to three a semester and I have I have three independent studies every semester. Right on, very they, cool. They all get A's and they all turn out amazing papers. So then what would you change about law school if you could? <sighs> I would propose every Friday we release a basket full of puppies. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what would I change about law school if I could? I mean, yeah. it, on one level, everything. Mm. <laughs> I, but I mean, more than anything, I, I, I think for me, it's the, it's the culture, right? No. There's a, there's a cop culture in law no. school and I don't like the cop culture, you know? So if there were anything I could change, it would be the cop culture. I want that to go away. You know, I really by the don't. students or by the professors? Both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, the students do it and the professors encourage it. And you know, I don't like it either way. I have to say one thing that I wasn't expecting coming into law school is that it, for me, has redefined failure. Mm. Because everyone warned me, everyone warned me, everyone walks in as a 4-0, but you don't understand the bludgeoning effect when you get those grades back. And suddenly mm. you are no longer achieving that standard of perfection you had set forth for yourself, mm. you know? But I guess the thing about that for me, right, is that like, what makes anyone think that those grades are accurate? Um, because you guys are a lot smarter than we are. I mean, uh. they're j bullshit. I mean, <laughs> grades are bullshit, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's mostly just gesturing and nonsense, right? No one's vetting our grading, right? I mean, I joked on Twitter the other day, you know, I'd love to have someone, I'd love to have someone like evaluate my grading ability, but please no. <laughs> 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 right? I mean, that would be incredibly embarrassing because I'm sure I'm terrible. Right? I, mean, I, I try really hard, but I'm sure I'm terrible at grading people, you know? And I'm grading people just to be a cop, you know? It's like, I, this, that's my least, my least, the only thing I truly hate about being a law professor is grading because it's so false and so fake and so wrong. Okay. I'm going on a limb asking this question. Do you have 
the authority to change the structure of the class so that you are giving quizzes and essays along the term instead of just one? Yeah, no, I mean, I can and do do whatever I feel like, right? I mean, like, you know, I mean, my exams are, you know, memos that I ask the students to write at the end of the semester over the course of several weeks, you know, where they can collaborate, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I mean, I feel like that sort of encapsulates a lot of what we're trying to do over the course of the semester. But my general feeling is like, look, I've got tenure. I can do whatever the hell I want. Um, so then what, what makes a student's essay stand out? Mm, mm. I mean, the ones that I remember the most are the ones that are the most creative. And this is what I try to tell students in, in general, right? I mean, like, look, what I, what I say is like, what I tell myself is that nobody cares what I think about things. And even more so, nobody cares what law students think don't about say. things, right? So, you know, if they don't care about what I think, they certainly don't care what law students think. So the point is, if you want to write something that matters, you need to write something that brings something new to the table, something that's surprising or novel or unexpected, right? <laughs> and so, among other things, like, I, you know, I've taught this... Uh, I've taught this class that I call, uh, it's like a seminar class called Law and Popular Culture. You know, usually that's like, you know, lawyers in movies or whatever. I think that's just kind of boring and not interesting. So instead I teach it as a, as a law and society class. And we just read a, like a range of different kinds of materials from different disciplines and watch documentary films and talk about how the law sort of how we can kind of think about social phenomena in legal terms so like as an example i teach one class that like one session of the class focuses on uh professional wrestling right right so we ask what is the law or what are the rules of professional wrestling, right? Because there's nominal rules, right? What you're allowed to do and not to do. But everyone knows that you're not supposed to observe those rules. In fact, you're supposed to violate those rules. And in fact, that's the entire point of professional wrestling is to violate the nominal rules, right? Like you're not supposed to go outside the ring. You're not supposed to harass a referee. You're not supposed to hit people with the chair. But if you didn't do those things, you would be not, you, that would be a bad match, <laughs> right so then the question is what are the real rules of professional wrestling and how do people know what the real rules are and how do they evaluate whether or not people are observing the rules and what's the relationship between the nominal rules and the real rules right so <clears throat> so what i do is i tell my students you all know things you you did things before you came to law school Right? You learn things before you came to law school, and you know things that I don't know. Right? So write a paper about something that you know that I don't know. Right? Uh, and, and, and when they do it, it's amazing. You know, I had one student, <clears throat> one of my favorite students of all time, Lena Baru, who wrote an amazing paper about IP norms around, uh, around tattooing. Right. And she went and interviewed a bunch of tattoo artists in, no, really? in Seattle where she lived and wrote this fantastic paper. And FYI, right, Lena was a student, and I think I think she'd be cool with me saying this. She was struggling with her grades in law school, but she got an A plus and callied my class because she wrote a fucking amazing paper. There is right? hope. Yeah. No, I mean <laughs> She wrote a fucking amazing paper and it was so good, right? I had another student who did something really similar. He was from the Jersey Shore. He wrote a paper about IP norms in the designs that barbers on the Jersey Shore would cut into people's hair, right? Uh -huh. 
Um, I had another student who did a fantastic paper about the um, the historical practice of mensur or academic fencing in uh, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, which was I, I'd never heard of it. It was like such a great it was such a great project, and I really really dug it. You know, and I had another paper she wrote about, she was a former uh, semi-pro ice skater, and she wrote a fantastic paper about uh, the development of ice skating judging norms and huh. sort of how people rationalized the way they currently were structured and criticisms of how they might be, you know, unfair and so on also a fantastic paper the point is in all of these cases these were things that students knew about that other people didn't know about and so the to my mind the best student papers well the best papers in general but especially the best student papers are the ones where students talk about things where they have special knowledge that other people don't have that's really cool the, honestly dude that is really freaking cool um I have one question left for you, mm -hmm. and this is from the Twitterverse, mm -hmm. and it's two, it's two part. Mm -hmm. Tell me about something in your pedagogical career that you achieved and never actually planned for. And on the flip side, tell me about something that you tried to achieve, but did not come to fruition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so I would say the entire sort of open access casebook thing is not something I ever planned for, but something that I felt obliged to do. And it's interestingly structured a lot of my thinking, you know? I mean, like working, like, Taking on open access casebook publishing as a project has been a huge part of my academic project. And I didn't, I certainly didn't anticipate that when I started, when I started teaching. And, and then I would say like in general, my entire academic career has been to my mind, like almost like intentionally structured as like just avoiding expectations, <laughs> 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 right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I try to research things and write about things that, that don't make sense for me, you know? <laughs> and, I, I, and in a way that's a kind of privilege right like i you know i mean i i i understand that i'm fortunate that i'm the kind of person where i can get away with that because i'm a white dude who went to a fancy school you know and i don't have to prove things to people in a lot of ways but i also want to be the person who can say that's cool right like do it your way and doing it your way is fine and there don't need to be rules, right? So, I mean, like I get that like that's a, that's a liberty that, that comes out of privilege, but I also feel a certain obligation to exercise it and to say other people should be able to exercise it as well. Brian, thank you so much for being so candid. Thank you so much for sharing. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, SJ, it was all my pleasure. And I can't say how happy I am to have you as the editor for the book I'm working on with, with Liz. <laughs> student now goes to college to proclaim rather than to learn. The lessons of the past are ignored and obliterated in a contemporary antagonism 
known as the Generation Gap. A spirit of national masochism prevails, encouraged by an effete core of impudent snobs who characterize themselves as intellectuals. A law-abiding American who believes in his country needs a strong voice to articulate his dissatisfaction with those who seek to destroy our heritage of liberty and our system of justice, to penetrate the cacophony of seditious drivel emanating from the best publicized clowns in our society and their fans in the fourth estate.